Hi everyone, this is going to be our second lecture on trusses, and in this lecture we'll be talking about the method of sections, which is usually a more effective and quicker way to solve trusses. So to give an overview of today's lecture, we'll talk about another way to analyze trusses, which is method of sections. Essentially, the steps will follow as you make a cut through the truss. We'll treat that cut as a single structure. We'll solve for the members uh, that we need to solve for. And as I was saying before, this method is usually much faster. Now, last time in our last lecture, we discussed what was called method of joints. A method of joints, what you did was you looked at every single joint in the truss. So in this particular example right here, we would have looked at section A, B, C, D, E, and G. For each of those joints, what we would have done was we would have looked at the forces of those members at that joint. So each member would have been drawn as a force. If you look at example G right here, every single member would have come out looking just like this right here. What you can see is that method of joints really is like we're using method of sections and that we made a cut around one single joint, in this case, joint G. So pretty much what's going to be different this time is that instead of making a section cut around a single joint, like in this case G, we're going to learn how to cut through a slice of the entire truss and analyze things by looking either to the left or to the right. And this will be more specifically the method of sections. All right, now to introduce the method of sections, let's look up here in the top right at this bunch of awesome grandmas cutting through this birthday cake. That's what you're gonna do from now on, is you're gonna embody these old grandmas and you're gonna look at your truss and you're gonna to wanna to cut right in. So in this particular example, let's assume that this dotted line right here is where we're gonna make a section cut. Now, if we made a section cut through those uh, members of the truss, we would choose to look either to the left or the right. And this would generate a truss that looked something like this. And our dividing line was right here. And had we looked to the right, we would have seen this structure over here, the right portion. And if we had looked to the left, we would have seen the left portion over here. What you can see is happening is that when you make a cut through a particular section, you treat each of the members you cut through as a force. So the members that we cut through were members CD, members CE, and members AE. And you can see that if we kept the left side, we would see all three of those members as forces. And had we kept the right side, we would see the exact same thing. We would see members CD, EC, and EA all also as members and forces themselves. So when we talk about method of sections, the idea is you're gonna make a cut through different members of the truss usually ones that you want to solve for. So most typically in a problem, you would have been asked to solve for members AE, members CE, and members CD. So the cut that you want to make is going to be a cut that goes through all three of those members. So in this particular case, the cut would have been very helpful to solve for three members A, E, C, E, and C, D. Now, one thing to point out is that when you make the cut, you do not see what's happening inside members D, E, B, E, or D, B, had you looked to the right, and you don't worry about what's happening to A, C. That's because these forces are referred to as internal to the truss, and they do not impact your analysis. Here you can see two more examples of method of sections being utilized. In both of these examples, what you're doing is again, you're making a cut through a particular section of the truss. So in this case right here, you would be making a cut through that section right there, or the truss on the right, you'd be making a cut through the middle three members 
like such. When you're doing this, the member forces are always assumed to be in tension. So something you realize by looking at this is that all the forces, the arrows, are always going out of the cut that you made. This means that we're assuming that each member is in tension. Now, this might not always be the case, but if you get a negative answer, that just means that that member, instead of being in tension, which you're making the assumption that it is, would be in compression. And when you make the section cut, you're going to keep either the left or the right side, and you'll be able to apply the equations of equilibrium to the piece that you're looking at as a whole. So we would apply the equations of equilibrium either to this piece over here or to this piece over here. And I'll show you what that looks like more in the next slide. All right. So as we just talked about on the last slide, we can see this example again, that we would have made a cut through the middle of this truss right here. Now, why is it advantageous to use method of sections? It's advantageous to use this method because when you make the cut, you'll look either to the left or to the right, and you'll look at that section as a whole. Because you're looking at the larger structure, you can now use three equations of equilibrium, which are the sum of the forces in the x, the sum of the forces in the y, and the sum of the moments. As a result, this allows you to solve truss problems a lot more quickly because you'll be able to target and identify the members you want to solve for right from the get-go. If you're using method of joints on this particular truss, what you would need to do is work piecemeal through the entire truss system to be able to get to the forces that you wanted to solve for. So in this example here, let's say the force that we really wanted to solve for was this force F1 or member BC. In order to solve for that using method of joints, we would first have to draw essentially a section cut of joint A down at the bottom, which is what we would arrive with right here. Now, the disadvantage of this is that because you're looking at a single joint, every single one of these forces will go through the same point right here. And because everything is going through this point A, the sum of the moments is going to be equal to zero. Therefore, you're left with only two equations of equilibrium, the sum of the forces in the X and the sum of the forces in the Y. Therefore, what you're going to have to do, essentially, is work step by step through the entire truss and solve for pretty much everything in order. So we'd have to solve for members AG and AB before we moved on to this piece over here, in which case we would then probably have to look at joint B and then solve for one of these three things, if that were possible. If that weren't, we would actually have to go to method or joint G and solve for everything and continue to move up. So what you can see is that method of sections was always going to be much faster than method of joints. And what we'll do in the next slide is we'll look at an example to illustrate, uh, work through and show you how much faster it is. All right, now in this example here, we're gonna look at a very simple truss labeled DEF. It has a pin connection down here at the bottom left. It's attached with a rope, which we know can only pull up at the top left. And there's an applied force of 2000 pounds acting straight down on point E on the right side of the truss. What we'll do is we'll move over to pen and paper and solve this problem for the forces that we're being asked to solve for, which are the forces in members DE and EF. All right. Now this All right. Now in this particular example, we have a truss, D, E, and F. F is supported by a pin down here. D is supported by a cable that's attached to a wall right here. And what we know is that the truss is five feet tall by 12 feet wide. We also know that we have a 2000 pound load right here, vertically downward on the end of the truss. So what we do is we'll just draw our X, Y axes right here, label them as positive. And what we have to do is solve for the members of the truss D, E, and E, F. Now those two members are right here and right here. So what we'll do is given that those are the two members we need to solve for, we will draw a line through that and we'll make a section cut. Now our section cut, we can either choose to look to the left or to the right. Now in this example, if you look to the left, 
you would see a cable support, which would be an unknown. You'd see two pin supports down here. And I'll draw those so we can kind of visualize what those are. So if we look to the left, we would see this force over here because it's external. We would see this force and we would see something that probably looks like this as well. So that's a lot of stuff going on. If we look to the right, the only thing that we'll see is these two members right here and 2,000 pounds. So it's going to be substantially easier for us to make a section cut and choose to look to the right. And when we do that, we then can redraw everything. And effectively, what we're doing now is method of joints. So now what you can see is at our section cut, we see the two members, DE. And we also see the member FE. We can tell here that we have DE and EF and the applied load of 2,000 pounds pushing down right here in the vertical Y direction. What we need to understand is the angle right here. And the way that we can do that is we can use similar triangles. So given that our larger triangle is 5 feet tall, 12 feet at the bottom, we have the hypotenuse right here, which we'll call X. We know that X is equal to the square root of 5 squared plus 12 squared. This tells us that x is equal to 13, and we have a 5, 12, 13 triangle, which we'll draw right here. Okay, now to solve this question here, it's pretty straightforward. We write a sum of the forces in the x and a sum of the forces in the y to solve. Given that DE is the only member that has a y component, and then we have this 2,000 pounds right here, what we'll do is we'll do some of the forces in the y first. So we'll set that equation up. We say some of the forces in the y is going to be equal to 0. It's going to be equal to 5 thirteenths de, which is dey component. We say that that's going up because we're assuming it's intention to start. So we have 5 thirteenths de minus 2,000 pounds. This allows us to solve for de. And this tells us that DE is going to be equal to 5,200 pounds. So now that DE is 5,200 pounds and it's positive, this indicates that this member is in tension, which we'll draw parentheses and T around to say that it's in tension. Now what we'll do is we'll do some of the forces in the X and we'll set this equal to zero. This will tell us that we have negative Fe or negative EF. It doesn't quite matter which way you say it. Negative Fe minus DE times 12 thirteenths or its X component. And that's it. Given that we know DE from the previous answer from above, we can plug in and we can solve for Fe. And what we get is that Fe is actually going to be equal to negative 4,800 pounds. Now what this negative sign means is that we drew our arrow wrong. Our arrow should be pointing in towards the node. And an arrow that points in towards the node indicates that that member is in compression. So what we'll say is our final answer here is we will report that Fe is equal to 4,800 pounds and we will say that that is in compression. And there we go. Now this question seems very simple, but let's look at the next slide and see that this problem here is actually Here you can see the answers that we just got in the last problem. Review this, make sure that it makes sense, then we'll move on to the next part. So, the question that we just worked on was actually a much smaller piece of this larger old exam question. On this old exam question, the first part of it asked you to identify all of the zero force members in this truss. What I'll have you do right now for about a minute or so is work on this question here 
and try to use these three uh, methods for identifying factors for zero force members to figure out which members in this truss are zero force members. And when you've done that, I'll show you how to actually solve. All right, if you haven't quite finished, we're gonna move on, but pause the video here if you wanna keep working. Otherwise, we'll move on to the solution for this first part in the next slide. So the problem that we just solved was actually a much uh, smaller piece of a larger problem that was actually an example exam question back in the day. Effectively, what we just did was we looked at only the right side of this truss. So effectively, we were doing method of sections on this piece right here by cutting through this line right here to solve for the member forces in DE and in EF, which is what we just did. Now what we'll do is answer the other part of this exam question, which was to identify all of the zero force members in this truss. So we'll erase this stuff right here and we'll look at our strategies for identifying zero force members so we can answer this question right here. Okay, now the way that we answer this question is we go joint by joint and identify if any of these three cases exists. So if we look at joint E, we have an external load. Anytime you have an external load, none of the forces that are touching that can be immediately ruled out as zero force members. So both DE and EF are good to go. The next joint we would go to would be to joint D. If we look at joint D, what we can realize is that we have the first case of zero force members, pretty much right here. We have two collinear members, CD and DE, and we have another member that is not in the same plane as those, which is DF. What this tells us is that DF is actually going to be a zero force member we can get rid of it based off of the rule that we just discussed. So now that we've done that, we've looked at section or joint D, we can go to joint F. Now that we've gotten rid of DF, something you can realize is that again, we've got the case where you've got two members that are collinear and you've got a member that is at a diagonal from that. Again, we have this example over here. As a result, member CF is also a zero force member. We can get rid of it. Now we keep going through. If we look at joint G, there's currently four things going on right there. So there's nothing that we could rule out. If we look at joint C, there's an external load of 4,000 pounds. So as a result, there's nothing that we can rule out right there. Joint A, that's a pin, which has external loads, both in the X and the Y direction because we know that a pin provides a Y force and an X force. Therefore, nothing can be ruled out as a zero force member there. And last but not least, we go to joint B. Joint B again has another external load of 2000 pounds. Therefore, we cannot rule anything out as being a zero force member. So the answer to this question is in terms of what are the zero force members? What well, we've already identified them. Those are members CF, and members TF. And that's it. All right, after you've identified the zero force members in the previous question, the exam question asks you to solve for the following things. It asks you to solve for the forces in members GF, members CF, member CD, member BG, and member CG. So something you should realize is that we have at least three members that we could make one single section cut through. That would be members GF, CF, and CD. 
and it's going to be quite advantageous for us to do this right here. Now, it'll also be important for us to remember that the zero force members we identified were the following, were DF and CF. So, if those two things are zero force members, what we'll be able to do by moving to the pen and the paper is that we'll be able to solve for the rest of the pieces of this question. All right. Our next question. All right. Our next question asks us to solve for the forces in members GF and CD. Fortunately, we can use what we solved for last time, which is the fact that member DE was 5,200 pounds of tension, and that member FE was 4,800 pounds in compression. If you look, given the fact that DF and CF were zero force members, we can now realize that the answer to this question is quite simple. So we identified that CF and DF were both zero force members. Given that this is the case, you can realize that by looking at member D and joint F, that the force in CD must equal the force in DE, and that the force in GF must equal the force in FE. So to write that more clearly, we would say that the force in CD is equal to the force in member DE, which is equal to 5,200 pounds of tension. And we would then write that the force in GF is equal to the force in FE, which is equal to 4,800 pounds of compression. We would box both of these answers right here. Nothing new or particularly exciting happened as of yet. We'll then move on to the next piece, which allows us to use method of sections. So the next thing we need to solve for is members BG and members CG. If we come back to looking at the problem from before, what we'll see is that members BG and CG don't really have any useful way to cut that would go through just those two things. We would have to expose a lot more than that. So what we'll do is we'll actually utilize method of joints for a method uh, to solve for BG and CG. So as you can see, what I just did was I drew method of joints at point G and at point C. The two last two things we need to solve for are BG and CG. So we can see both of them are in this picture over here, and only one of them is in this picture over here. Now if we look over here, we do know FG because FG is GF, which is 4,800 pounds. We don't, however, know CG, BG, or AG. So this piece over here right now is unsolvable. So the only place we can go to is this piece over here, which is looking at the joint C. When we look at joint C, something interesting actually happens. We can realize that we have the 4,000 pounds applied here, CG would be directed upward, and we would have BC and CD, which are collinear. Because BC and CD fall along the same line, and because 4,000 and CG fall along the same line, what we can realize is that this 4,000 has to be the same as this CG. So this leads us to the fact that CG is equal to 4,000 pounds. And because we drew it pointing up towards the node, that means that it is in compression. Now that we know that CG is 4,000 pounds, we have only one thing left to do, which is to take this value here and utilize our equations of equilibrium over here. Because now we will know CG but we will not yet know BG or AG, but that has two unknowns and we can always write two equations. Now, what you can realize is that CG is directed in the vertical force, Y direction, and BG also has a vertical component. So if we write the sum of the forces in the Y at this joint G, we will be able to very quickly solve for BG, which we'll do right now. So by looking at joint G,
What we can say is that the sum of the forces on the y direction must equal zero, which is going to tell us that we have BGY going up minus CG equal to zero. Well, what is BGY? The way that we figure that out is by coming over to here and doing some similar triangles. What we can realize about BG is that the triangle that BG is a part of looks like this, which is 15 feet tall by 12 feet at the bottom. So if we have a 12, 15, we have some X value right here. And we can figure out that X by taking the square root of 15 squared plus 12 squared. This tells us that X is equal to about 19.2. So if that's the case, we can come over to here and we can rewrite our equation to say that BGY is going to be 15 over 19.2 times BG minus CG, which we solved for above, was 4,000 pounds. This will get us an answer for BG that is positive and is 5,120 pounds. What this tells us because we got a positive answer and because BG had been drawn out of the node over here as that our answer is correct and that we have a tension. We've now solved for everything in this problem and the last thing that we really had to solve for was member CF but CF we say is equal to zero by zero force member inspection. And that's it. That's all that you have to do to solve this exam question. And that is all of our final answer. Here you can see all of the answers that we just got by working the problem out on the pen and the paper. And again, the way that we did that effectively was that we first made a section cut to this piece over here and looked at and solved for members EF and DE. The reason this was advantageous is because the forces that we had to solve for were members GF, CF, CD, CG, and BG. Because using zero force members helped us identify that that member CF and that member DF were zero, we were able to realize that member CD and member DE were the same, and that member GF and FE were the same. Once we did that, we then combined this solution methodology by looking at the method of joints by identifying joint G and joint C. Now to erase some of this stuff right here, so it's a little bit easier to see, when we looked at joint C, what we realized was that the force of 4,000 pounds vertically and the force of CG were in the same line. We already remembered that CF did not exist because it was a zero force member and that members BC and CD were collinear. Therefore, members CG and the 4,000 pounds were equal as we can see right here. And BG essentially was then obtained by looking at the sum of the Y forces at G and comparing the Y component of BG to the 4,000 pounds we solved for for CG, and that arrived us at the value for BG right here. All right, now that last question we cheated a little bit because we pretty much used method of joints for that question. Here's an example where you would really use method of sections to solve for everything. So in this particular case, what our question is asking us to solve for is the forces in members BC, CE, and EF. So if we look at those three things right here, we can highlight member BC, member CE, and member EF. What you can realize is that those three things right there form a nice Z or sideways N. And whenever that's the case, what you'll almost always wanna do is make a section cut 
through the middle of those three things right there. Now the choice we have is either to look to the left or to the right, and we'll figure out which way we want to do that on the next slide. So if we're looking at this question right here, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out if we make a section cut through the three members that we're asked to solve for, BC, EC, and EF, we're trying to figure out which way we want to look. And our question is essentially, do we want to look to the left side of the truss, or do we want to make our cut and look to the right side and keep that? Well, the way that you figure this out is you look at the end conditions. If we look at our end condition over here at joint A, we should realize that this is a pin, and pins have two conditions, or external forces applied to them. If we look at joint D, that's attached to a roller, which has only one single force applied to it, which is our reaction force in the D, which is vertical up. So what we're going to do is we need to first solve for this force right here. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at the truss as one giant system. You might be saying, what? How does that work? Well, here's how it effectively works. Let's array some of our stuff here, make our picture a little bit more clear, and we'll try and figure out how we're gonna solve for the reaction force D, which is our one unknown. The way that we'll do this is we'll look at the whole picture and we'll sum our moments about point A. So if we sum the moments about point A, we have essentially three things that will go into that. What you can see via line of action is that we will have our force RD, which is right here, multiplied by a distance of three. Well, where does that distance of three come from? That distance of three, which I'll get rid of that purple because that's a little hard to see, our distance of three comes from this distance right here. It's force times distance is a moment. What you can also see is that we have 50, which is right here, multiplied by a value of two. And that again is because 50 is two meters away from that force right there. And last but not least, we have our force of 80 kilonewtons up here. And that 80 kilonewtons, as you can see, is a value of 0 0.75 meters away from the bottom. So we can see there's our value of 0 0.75 and here's our 80. By doing this, what we can learn is that the reaction force at D is 53.33 kilonewtons. The next step would be to keep the forces and everything to the right. And what we would identify is that the three forces that we had previously highlighted, FBC, FCE, and FEF, are now visible. And we now know everything to the right of our cut. So the way that we would go about solving this question would be to sum the moments about point E. And the reason why it's very advantageous in method of sections to sum the moment about point E is because if you look, both force CE and force EF intersect through that joint. Therefore, neither of those things enter our moment equation. And the only things that we have left are FBC times its vertical distance, 0.75, right here. We have our force 80, again, times 0 0.75 using line of action. We have 50 kilonewtons right here. And that 50 kilonewtons is going to be multiplied by a value of 1, because that is how far that is away from point E. And then we have 2 times RD, because here is RD right here. And then is it a value of two meters away from that. So once we do all that, we can solve for the force in FBC, and we can get that that is a value of 4.45 kilonewtons of tension. Well, once we know FBC, what we can do, and let me erase these lines here so it's a little easier to see, is we can do the sum of the moments about point C. And if we do the sum of the moments about point C, what we can realize then is that Everything except FEF will intersect that line. And we would do very much the same equation that we did before. 
So if we're doing the moments about point C right here, you can see that this force, 80 kilonewtons, passes through that and won't be included in the equation. FBC passes through point C and has no moment. FCE has no moment about point C, and our 50 kilonewtons also has no moment about point C because that goes up through here. This leaves us with a very simple equation that allows us to solve for the force in member EF, which we get is 71.1 kilonewtons of tension. And last but not least, we can just do a sum of the forces and pretty much look at the whole system together. And when we do that, this is a sum of the forces in the Y. So we can see we have a 50 kilonewtons right here, which is our vertical force. We have a reaction in the D, which is right there. And then we have FCE, which has a vertical component right here, which is going to be three fifths of FCE. And this allows us to solve for FCE right there. So I'll upload the solutions to this question here. This is another good one where you can practice using the method of sections. And the idea that you'll want to do here is you'll want to identify the forces in members CD, the members CH, member CI, and member IJ. Now, one thing you can realize is that there's not really one clean cut you can make through all of these things to make it particularly easy. But when I attach the solutions to this, you will find that the answers to these questions are the following. And eventually, what you'll realize is that it is far, 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 far easier to do method of sections than it is to do method of joints for this question. And you will see that when I upload the solutions. But what I recommend you to do is to work on this question on your own as practice to make sure that you understand the principles that we have. And pretty much the steps that you want to follow for every trust problem are the same. So something I want to show you here is how method of sections can be much, much faster than using method of joints to solve a problem. So here you can see the last example, and I'll post these solutions. But here, this question was asking for essentially a few members of force. So when we look at this question here, and I used method of sections, and I made a section cut right here and looked upward for the truss, I would be able to solve for all of the unknowns in about maybe 70% of the paper. That I had for the exam. Now, had I made the section cut and looked downward instead of upward, what you would see is that it would take me a little bit more work to solve the problem, but it still wouldn't be particularly bad because I would have essentially one free body diagram here and just a bunch of other moment equations. However, if you look at the method of joints, methodology of solving this, you would have to make one, two, three, four, five free body diagrams, which is 10 equations to solve all of these things. If you look at the other side, if you had done method of joints and started from the other direction, you would still have had to draw one, two, three, four free body diagrams, but which would get you eight equations. You can see in my solutions, I wrote that method of joints was a very sad face because it took so much longer to do than the rest. And I'll post these solutions so you can go through working out yourself and see which way. So to review, the way that you want to approach solving most every trust problem is to follow the following steps. Step number one will have you highlight the members that you wish to solve for. Usually I recommend that you take a physical highlighter out or use your computer and pretty much highlight the things that you want it to solve for. This will help you identify which strategy you want to use. Step two will be to identify any zero force members of the trust because it might turn out that one of the members you're trying to solve for is a zero force member, which in this particular case, you would learn that member CI was a zero force member. Step three would be to try and cut through as many members as you can and solve using method of sections. 
So a good strategy to do would be to cut through right here, most likely. And your decision is always to figure out whether you want to look up or down. In this particular case, we would want to look up because we would avoid the support reactions at the bottom because those have more forces that we would have to solve for. And step four, we would try and sum the moments about points where pieces of the members align. In this particular case, point C might be useful because that is where both CH and CD intersect, and that would allow us to solve for member HI, which is right here. Alternatively, we could sum our moments about the following point, H, and that would allow us to solve for the member CD over here. Now it's your turn to practice and continue to work on the homework and group work to learn and get better with trusses. That concludes our lecture for today, and hopefully you now understand trusses more completely. In the ENES 102 course, students usually work in teams to build a trust project. The students are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, regular students who build the trust and the crazy kids who sometimes take things too far. These are their stories.